before we get into this week's episode, I want to make a plug for Art Market Minute. This is Artnet News's new micro podcast hosted by Margaret Kerrigan, who's the site's news editor, Europe. It offers a weekly snapshot of essential art market news expertly compiled by the Artnet Pro editorial team. And as a result, this lively art scene that's growing more and more is really the result of private sector initiatives, collectors, art patrons, galleries, and largely the artists themselves. Hi, I'm Tim Schneider, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News, where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. It's late August, and for the first time in two years, it looks like the fall art season could be jam-packed with major in-person art market events, even if some of them don't normally happen while Starbucks is once again working to coat the entire planet in pumpkin spice. But this summer... Art world trends and circumstances way beyond the industry's control have led to some of the most noteworthy market activity happening in two destinations we're not so used to seeing make headlines. Monaco and Accra, the capital of Ghana. What's so interesting to me about these two places is that together they form a kind of art market yin-yang symbol. The areas where one of them is strong are the areas where the other is weak and vice versa. So by pairing them up, we can see something close to the full spectrum of forces shaping the global art market today. To help us on this expedition, I am going to be joined on the show today by two great guests who recently reported on these destinations firsthand for Artnet News Pro. First up, I'm going to talk to Kate Brown, our European editor at Artnet News, about her summer sojourn to Monaco. Then I will connect with Rebecca Ann Proctor, the seasoned, globetrotting art journalist, to hear about the art scene bubbling up in Accra. If you listen to this episode and you have a question about one of these two growing art markets or anything else, including recommendations for future episodes of the show, you can email us at podcasts at artnet.com. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T-S at artnet.com. Okay, pack your bags. We are going to Monaco. Kate Brown, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. So before we get into Monaco's art market, I'm hoping that you can just set the stage by telling me a little bit about Monaco as a place in general. I suck at geography, so I know it's in Europe and I kind of think I know where, but what is it nearby? How big is it? What should we even use to talk about it? Like, is it a city? Is it a country? Is it something else? Like, help me out here. Yeah, it's a bit unclear for sure. Before you realize that you're in Monaco, you might have already driven through it because it's so incredibly small. It's the smallest city state in the world after the Vatican City. So it's a country that's formed around a city, sort of like Singapore, except Singaporeans pay taxes. (laughs) As a reference point for size, it's smaller than Central Park. It's about the size of Tiergarten in Berlin. And France surrounds it on all sides. And then there's the Mediterranean on one side. And it's basically just this incredibly tiny, affluent city slash country that's stacked vertically on the cliffs of the Mediterranean. There's 1980s high rises that a lot of people seem to hate, but I actually found them quite nice. And, you know, some palatial buildings in between, like the Casino Monte Carlo and so on. A short sketch of the place, because I think it matters to know the history in order to understand what's like happening there with the art market today. It was sort of a contested zone for centuries, going back to the Middle Ages. It was run over by Napoleon for a bit and became a French protectorate before it was handed back to the Grimaldi family, a princely house that was before and after heavily taxing the Monegasque people. And the actual location of Art Monte Carlo, the fair, is in the Grimaldi Forum. So they're very much still a presence there symbolically. And yeah, a couple years after the country was founded, all the Monegasques stopped having to pay taxes. And that was thanks to a casino that the Grimaldis opened because somehow this princely family was going bankrupt. And so the Casino Monte Carlo is kind of the centerpiece of the very small city state. So it became hugely popular almost immediately and was a gold rush for Monaco. And so soon after, tax returns were basically canceled. And the only catch is that, you know, you have to show your passport at the casino because Monegasques can't gamble. Only foreigners can gamble there and the house always wins. (laughs) Okay, so this is helpful because coming into this conversation, As somebody who's never been to Monaco personally, I sort of just always have this image in my head of 
like James Bond at a casino table with like a rogues gallery of like very shady but very wealthy people. And I'm always like, ah, is this just a stereotype that I have because I'm a foreigner and I haven't been there? But you're very much making it sound like it's maybe not that far off reality. No, Tim, this would not disappoint your imagination. (laughs) It's like Bentley's pulling up at the casino. Conspicuous wealth is just on such full display. Like outside of my hotel, there was the actual Batmobile was parked one day, like between like a Bugatti and a Lamborghini. Like it is so affluent and so bondy with this sort of landscape that it's all kind of just flat lines and it just becomes sort of normal to you after even being there for 28 hours. But that being said, I wouldn't say that it's as stylish as a Bond film in real life. That might be sort of the caveat. A few Swiss collectors actually like were complaining to me about how vulgar and tacky Monaco is. It's sort of like the butt of a joke in a way, but then of course everybody's there. So Well, I, I feel like nothing quite defines a lot of very wealthy people like being able to still complain about things regardless of how nice they are. <laughs> That's true. All right. I feel like I've got a good picture now of Monaco. So let's shift into the art scene in particular. So Obviously, in the past 18 to 20 months or so, things have changed in Monaco's art world, just like they've changed in pretty much every other place on Earth. So before we get into the changes, can you just tell us a little bit about what the art scene and the art market in Monaco were like before COVID entered the picture? And if you don't mind, I'd love to start with the auction houses, because I feel like they're going to be sort of a a major presence here for a while. Mm -hmm, Definitely agree. Yeah, Sotheby's has actually been there for decades, I think since the 1950s. They've had an office there, and they've been doing private sales, checking in with clients and seeking consignments. And in general, especially with the secondary market, like I think that the pandemic accelerated a transformation that was already beginning to happen. The French auction house Art Curiel had actually had its first sculpture show and sale there in 2019 and had opened up a permanent space. So if anything, you know, I think that the lockdown just sort of created this sort of captive audience, which really like accelerated the desire for people to set up bigger shops and more ambitious projects there because they had all these affluent people that were just camped out and bored. Sotheby's and Christie's have both now opened different kinds of showrooms. Sotheby's is a permanent one and Christie's has a pop-up. But private sales in general, like as we've reported on, have just grown exponentially in 2020. And so both of them are doing cross-category sales. Like there's Hermes handbags a couple feet away from a treasure of modern art or a Botero painting. And I think it's they're just offering all that they have, and there's no need to sort of curate it necessarily, but also that's a testament to just the lack of space in Monaco. Like, everything just necessarily needs to be kind of jammed up against each other. So Sotheby's has this kind of two-story gallery showroom, and they're going to be there for a while. They've really, like, camped out and gotten a lease there. And Christie's is hosting a pop-up sale at Cipriani's, which is this restaurant that I actually ended up going to three times in three days. It's like this watering hole of the art world. And they also, you know, were offering selections of diamonds, Giacometti sculptures, and there was a Picasso hanging over the cash desk that was sold to a diner who had just sort of come in and seen it. The point is really that people's eyes had already been on it, but I think that the pandemic was really a catalyst to staking a claim. That image of a Picasso hanging above a cash register in a cramped restaurant because there's nowhere else to put it and somebody just coming in and buying it anyway feels like as far as metaphors go, like it's about as on the nose as you can get for Monaco. <laughs> All right. So that's the auction houses. What about galleries and art fairs? What were they like before the pandemic? There was a group of galleries that have been there and that are there, but not internationally based ones. So before the pandemic, there was NM Contemporary and Camille Gallery and some others. And Similar to what we saw with the secondary market, like just before the pandemic, there was a couple notable changes. Fabrizio Moretti, who's a notable dealer from Florence, who also has an outpost in London, and he specializes in old masters. He'd opened up a space in Monaco in 2017, quite presciently. And of course, there's the art fair, Art Monte Carlo, which opened in 2016. The growth in the gallery scene was there before the pandemic and definitely amping up, but not substantially. And then, of course, post-pandemic this spring, we saw a lot of activity. Hauser & Worth opened up a really striking permanent space that is like kind of built underground due to the sort of lack of space in Monaco. And Johann Koenig was doing something sort of Christie style and had a pop-up for the summer. And he was showing his art in this interior design show house. Got it. And I think that you also had mentioned another dealer named Kamel Manor. 
does he just have a house there and he's just set it up to show art while all these festivities were happening? Was that kind of the situation? Yeah, well, again, as I said, you know, before you know it, you're not in Monaco anymore. Like, his house is in France, so... It was a 20-minute drive, but we were in another country. And I had talked to him about if he was planning on opening up a space in Monaco, but he sort of said that the real estate there is so gridlocked. And for him in particular, if you know his spaces in London and Paris, he really looks for particular kinds of places. And he just said he couldn't find the kind of location that he would want in Monaco. On that note, the price per square meter is like 10,000 euros for an apartment there. So roughly 930 euros a square foot because people want to have their primary residence there to like benefit from the lack of income tax. But of course, it's not a huge place. So this is really really going to affect the kind of activity that you see here. Like it will only be a certain echelon will ever really be able to get a permanent space there, right? This seems like an opportune moment to talk about why you were actually there in this particular week, which was the latest edition of the uh, Art Monte Carlo Fair. So was it the first time that you'd been there? And either way, what was so different about it this year as opposed to previous years? I hadn't been there before, but I had been reading the coverage. So what I can say that I know is that it was much smaller than 2019. Like it was down from 73 galleries to just 27 this year. I have to say, like, I loved that. And especially like in this sort of post-pandemic first fair experience, the fair was so manageable to get around. I felt like I could really grasp what was going on, what the topics were. And I had the feeling that collectors felt the same and dealers seemed quite happy about the size. Like there were no complaints about the fact that it was smaller, not even from the fair itself, because they had a lot of really great galleries there. You know, like Pace was there, Hauser and Worth, Palatin. This is really like something that is maybe a distinguishing factor for Art Monte Carlo Fair is the kind of quality of galleries that they can bring in. And another major difference at the fair this year was the presence of this little Tifaf Maastricht cohort, So Dickinson, Waddington, Cousteau, and Thomas Gibson, one of them told me that they had sort of informally chatted amongst each other and decided to try out Art Monte Carlo in the absence of TFAF. So that's definitely a testament to the quality of this fair in a way, although it's a fraction of the size and a fraction of the diversity of offerings that TFAF has, to be fair. And another major difference that I think was quite favorable is that the fair had, due to lockdowns, moved from its spring slot into the summer. So it incidentally overlapped with Cannes, which is right next door in France, and all of these holidaying people that are on the French Riviera all summer who are in great moods and have money to spend. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if they stay with their July slot. Yeah, I feel like that's going to be a really interesting thing to see happen over the course of the next year or two, just because... Some of the opportunities you're talking about both here and what I've seen happen in other places, they all seem to be about these dead zones in the calendar that aren't normally there. And at some point, it seems like people are going to have to start making decisions about, well, we're holding the fair in September, say, this year, like Art Basel is. Are we going to shift it back to June? And if they do, and I assume that they will, How does that end up affecting the moves that people have made in a place like Monaco, which seems like it's really benefited from there just being more space for another region or city state to come in and make its presence felt? Yeah, absolutely. It'll be interesting to see how the dust settles after, because I think wherever Basel ends up being on the calendar, it'll really affect the way the other fairs need to be, because, you know, dealers won't have the energy to go to -to back-to-back fairs after Basel. Yeah. One of the other curious things about the pandemic, for me at least, is just what you were talking about, where people seem to have really enjoyed the idea that this was a smaller, more approachable experience. And that's very much the opposite of the direction that the art world has been moving for a very long time. Everything has just become supersized and scaled up. And you're used to going to these fairs that have a few hundred galleries in them. And It shouldn't really be a surprise to people like, oh, wow, I'd really rather just go see 27 galleries than 227. But I don't know if we can actually make that shift all the way back. Yeah, I wonder. And I think in the case of Art Monte Carlo as well, I think location will be really reconsidered. A fair makes a lot of sense in a place like Monaco, where most galleries wouldn't be able to set up shop there. There's just such a high threshold for the kind of cash flow that you would need. So, you know, a small boutique fair is like absolutely logical, maybe less logical in a metropolitan city where you can get some real estate pretty easily. Yeah, that makes sense. 
So in terms of the actual types of artworks that are being shown and being sold in Monaco and all these different places over the summer, is it all just very high-end stuff? Because it seems like the market definitely tilts in that direction between both the people who normally live and travel to Monaco and just, as you're saying, there's been this huge influx of really blue-chip dealers and auction houses who've come in there and really, I'm sure, are tacking toward the high end. But is there other stuff being sold there as well? In my observation, I found that it was all high end. Like there wasn't a lot of emerging positions that I could see at Art Monte Carlo. And at least they weren't like the loudest positions in any of the booths that I saw. And in my opinion, like dealers were really playing it safe. So I'll be curious to see what the fairs are like this fall. They didn't seem to be taking much of a gamble. It was almost exclusively group presentations with key works or sort of iconic manifestations of works by well-known artists. And I think it's really a testament to the times and the caution that's needed right now as everyone's sort of like trying all these different directions and trying to figure out where the art industry is going to land at the end of this pandemic. It certainly speaks to the kind of collector that one finds in Monaco. You know, David Nemad, Patricia Marshall, Eskandar and Fatima Maleki attended. And so there's not a lot of emerging collectors I didn't have the sense or I didn't really hear about them or run into them as much as hearing about these sort of large scale collectors. So I think that dealers are bringing work sort of to respond to that. To be fair, I don't think it did a great favor to the art in some senses, but again, most of the artists on view were established, so there's less to prove, and most definitely the quality of works was very high. Pelote sold a Hernan Bass for around 200,000 euros, and Thomas Gibson had sold a work by Alberto Giacometti, Francis Nero had sold Robert Maplethorpe and Sam Falls, and, you know, Hauser and Wirth had really incredible works by Maria Lasnig, a painting that went for 550,000 euros. This was kind of the sort of echelon of work that we were seeing there, and that was selling. Right. And that makes sense, again, just based on the audience. I feel like even if the very wealthy people who live in Monaco, wanted to take a swing on some more emerging talent, they're probably not going to do it there. They'll probably go to some other fair or some other gallery somewhere else in the world. It just seems like it would almost be out of place to come to Monaco and almost not even economically feasible to show up with a booth where you're saying like, yeah, here are a bunch of artists that are $10,000 $10,000 or less per piece. Exactly. And, you know, there's so many fairs that do that really well, like Lista, for example, where like when you're you're going there, you know, you're getting a certain quality of emerging artists and new positions. So I agree. I don't think it's the place for it. So the kind of activity that you're talking about here sounds actually really familiar to me in a way as a degenerate art market observer who has been trying to keep tabs on the rest of the art world from my desk in Brooklyn. Do you see what's happening in Monaco to some extent, at least, as being part of the same trend that's really driven high-end dealers, high-end collectors, high-end auction houses to places like the Hamptons and Palm Beach and Aspen? Most definitely. And in certain terms, like Mark Armstrong from Sotheby's Monaco said to me that part of the desire to set up this permanent space was to create a similar destination experience. And they were very much looking to the similar setups in the Hamptons, Palm Beach or Aspen. And Monaco was quite ideal for that in a lot of ways. And I think, you know, in the lockdown, all these different sellers had to get creative on how to reach their audiences suddenly. And many of them had gone rural to their secondary homes. So they just decided to follow them there and they followed them to the French Riviera. But, you know, a lot of these people stayed rural into the summer. And I had the feeling that a lot of the people there just had been there. They were so unruffled. So it's definitely Europe's answer to bringing art to the collectors and their beautiful hideaways. It's also not just the people on the Riviera. Like Monaco is really well located. It's drivable from Geneva, Turin and Milan. And on the Riviera, you know, you can take a boat to Genoa, Cannes, St. Tropez, like it's just right there. So it's both remote and an enclosure, but it's also really well located to a lot of collector hubs and a lot of collectors. Oh, that's interesting. So it's also sort of a European way station in a way where even though space is really tight, you can still get there easily from a lot of other desirable places. Exactly. And, you know, I think most of the collectors were probably visiting as well and coming through because they're down inside Topaz or something. Yeah, right. Exactly. And one other thing that seems like it's similar is just to tie everything back to tax law, (laughs) I guess. I mean, you can't separate these things in the art market. One of my all-time favorite quotes is from this guy, Charlie Munger, who's a Warren Buffett's business partner. And long ago, he said, show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcome. 
And what you're talking about with Monaco and what we've seen, especially in Palm Beach, where Florida has no state income tax either and a lot of other favorable things for wealthy people, like the money flows there partly for tax reasons, the lifestyle kind of follows it. And that is a template that travels both in the art world and just sort of in every other financial walk of life, it seems like. Mm, Totally. I mean, Switzerland, Basel, similar story in a way. There is actually tax on art in Monaco, like it's 4.5% sales tax on art sold. So it's the same as France, but lower than other places. So even though Monaco does have these other parallels to these other art markets, or regional art markets that have benefited during the pandemic, it does also seem like there are some aspects of it that are always going to be unique. And one moment from your story about going there that really stuck with me was that somebody said to you, and I'm going to quote here, Monaco is sort of public private, end quote. And my favorite part about that is that it's not just that quote. It's also the fact that the person didn't even want to go on the record to say it. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, the statement was quite unsettling to me, to be honest, I'm going to sound a bit proverbial here, but like if a work goes for sale in Monaco and an auction house doesn't sell it, is the work burned? Probably not because nobody saw it. Like that's sort of what the person was saying to me, that like you can show a private sale work here and it doesn't really affect its market because it was sort of like it never happened. And so that that is definitely a strategic advantage to Monaco. But to me, it's also a bit problematic. Like I have a little bit of a problem with the art world setting up so eagerly in all of these places. When we think idealistically about the art industry, there's this ideal baked into it that like a regular person can be crossing through Mayfair or Chelsea and that they might walk into a gallery because it looks interesting and it's free to go in. Or they might go to an art fair because it's 15 bucks on the sixth day and they're curious. And, you know, in Monaco, around 30 percent of the people are millionaires. And I think we need to ask ourselves if we're like totally fine with just accepting this level of the art market completely amputating itself from the rest of the world, which is sort of the downside of this phenomenon that we've been seeing through the pandemic with these offsite locations. I'm never going to get to see the Mark Bradford show in Menorca probably because, you know, and I, I work in this business, but it's just not really feasible to get there for me. And what does that mean for people aspiring in the cultural field or otherwise? What about people from lower incomes or from less advantaged places? I think part of the reason that you can have tax write-offs on art, on foundations, why you can get grants from the government is because people see art as a public good. But to go back to that quote, if it's not really public, then like, what are we doing here, you know? And so there's a certain kind of criticality that I think needs to be had about not just pure jubilance about like how great it's going there for these startups, if you will. Another quote I heard from someone, you know, is that there's no normal people in Monaco. And I think we really need to consider that. But to round off, Monaco has nice views, nice art, cool cars. And Cipriani's, I can report, has a wonderful vanilla ice cream that Simon Dupuri introduced me to. So I do suggest it if you ever make it there. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I will take that under advisement. Kate, I feel like I've learned a ton about Monaco. Thank you so much for coming on. Okay, as promised at the top of this episode, let's shift our focus from the high-end art market and quasi-members-only club of Monaco to Accra, where a very different type of art scene is emerging in West Africa. To tell us about it, I want to welcome in Rebecca Ann Proctor. Rebecca, thanks for being back on The Art Angle. Thanks, Tim. So we've obviously just talked with Kate about the art market in Monaco, which has developed in this very top-down, insider-driven way, largely because a lot of very wealthy, established collectors and dealers either have homes there or can get there easily. It's just a place that they like to hang out. And they're sort of building the market around themselves to some extent there. That strikes me as being almost the polar opposite of what's happening in Accra, the capital of Ghana. And that is a market that you've very recently written about. And it seems like Accra has caught the larger art world's attention because of the recent success of some now very hot, very in-demand young artists who have roots there, especially Amawako Boafo. So can you just tell us who Amawako Boafo is and why he has become so important to the art scene in Accra? Accra, Ghana probably couldn't be 
farther away in many senses from Monaco. But again, the thing that it does have in the similarity, perhaps, is the fact that there is a really exciting art scene that is taking place there, but driven by artists and, you know, a few big dealers and collectors. And yes, I've seen over the years a big change, just a lot more artists. Every time I go, there's just more and more artists, more and more Africans who want to be artists. But something really, really shifted since Mwaka Bwafo came on the scene. I actually first encountered his work in the summer, July 2019, when I was in Los Angeles. And it was at Danny First, The Cabin. And he was doing an art residency there. And actually, gallerist Marion Ibrahim recommended that I go check him out. In fact, Mwaka was very much not known at that point. So I went to this residency I was really taken by Mwako's portraits. It's hard not to be sort of enthralled by their beauty and their power, his signature fingerprint way of creating the portraits and the figures that stand that are in front of you. And, you know, they're all quite large scale. And just a few months later, the world entered into the pandemic that we are now. But that didn't seem to stop Mwako's rise to fame. He, at that point, was a Ghanaian painter who was selling works for as little as $100, mostly to support his family. It's a mix of art world figures and dealers and collectors that really sort of brought him to the fame that he found himself in at the end of 2020 and during this incredibly challenging year with the rise and the interest that the world had in contemporary art from Africa. I think that also fostered a great interest in his work. Obviously, we've seen that the African-American art scene is the works are extremely in demand. They're going for really big numbers, but we haven't really seen as big numbers as we've seen maybe from the African art scene. So Mariam Ibrahim has been instrumental, obviously, Danny First and several other dealers. So when he sold for just shy of a million dollars at Phillips sale, I think it was February 2020, that was a big deal going from maybe a few hundred dollars, a few thousand dollars up to just shy of a million dollars in just one year and also during a year that really threw us all on a roller coaster. His rise to stardom internationally has really encouraged a whole new generation of young Ghanaian artists, painters mostly. And there's a lot of portraiture right now. Portraiture is really big in West Africa. And I was really amazed by the many artists that I've seen during this trip. They want to do what they love to do, creating art. And they realize that if Mwaka made it, they can do it too. They can become an artist. Now there's a precedent set and they can make a lot of money too through art. There's a real kind of revolution almost going on there. And Mwako has been at the forefront of this huge change and drive to become an artist. Right. So if we zoom out on it a little bit, it's in some sense a classic art world story of a very young rising star who's super talented, attracts a lot of market attention and institutional attention. And inevitably, you have a lot of the people who are either already interested in this particular young rising star or people who couldn't get in on him because the demand is too high, saying like, okay, who else is out there to some extent that we might be able to start looking towards as an alternative or as a next figure? Is that sort of accurate? Definitely. And I've seen in the past year, since Mwako has been so in demand, this has obviously created demand for other young rising stars from Ghana. One is Kwesi Bachwe. I remember interviewed him, gosh, over a year ago. And just in a few months, he has a waiting list. His prices are soaring up into the few hundred thousands. And now he has a secondary market. He's painting very much in the same genre as Mwako, um, portraiture. So there's this idea of creating the African figure, the African individual. They're strong, they're determined, and they're painted very gestural, very proud and bold. So he's one of the ones I'd say is a rising star that has a lot of demand. There's also Otis Kwam K. Kwesi. He's also a Ghanaian painter who's gotten a lot of attention in the U.S. also for his lush, richly painted African, again, portraits. Portraits are scenes from sort of everyday life. And he's also, again, I've been told, has a waiting list. There's also Anan Aptoi that's recently had a show with Gallery 1957, which is basically um, Accra's premier commercial art gallery. So he had a solo show. There was a show that I saw when I was there called Ganata Strong. So Ganata College of Art, which closed actually in 2015 due to funding, I was told, basically was Ghana's forefront, foremost school for studying art. And a lot of these guys went to school together. Mwako went to school there, Otis as well, Anan, their friends and their colleagues, and they help each other. So there's also this idea of camaraderie between artists, and that echoes within their work. 
There's also Serge Adekwe Cloti, who you could say he's one of Ghana's big stars from four to five years ago. He works a lot with the Accra Bass Gallery in 1957. He's done work for Facebook in California. He's all over the place at the moment. And he's known for his multidisciplinary practice, notably his use of yellow gallon containers that are ubiquitous in Ghana and Africa. But he also works in drawing and painting and photography and performance. Yeah, and I think there are a couple of interesting points that you raised in there. One being that it's not that Boafa was the first Ghanaian artist to really attract some amount of international attention. It just seems like he's taken off at a speed that has really set him apart, in a sense. And you're also nodding towards a really important aspect of all this, which is just that this is happening at a time when the art market is just rabid for figurative painting by black artists and artists of color. And so it's sort of an opportune moment. I'm in no way saying that the artists who are doing this are trying to just ride a wave, but the way that taste has trended over the course of the past few years in Western galleries and Western institutions and Western collectors makes this an opportune moment to be making that kind of work. So that seems like it's a part of all this as well. As you've just said, it's the speed that he rose and also during this incredible time. But I think take coronavirus away, he still would have risen up quickly because of the context in which he's rising. You know, he's creating his work. And yeah, there is this hunger for black art. That is what's happening. And that's where the figuration, whether it be in the West or Africa, there is this hunger to finally exalt the black man, the black woman, Black life, again, whether it be in Africa or whether it be in the U.S. or the Caribbean or the diaspora. And that, I think, obviously conditions the success of artists like Amwako. But he's definitely not the first. There's always been art scenes in these places. They just haven't been really documented, even looked upon as much until recently. And one is Africa. You know, we usually looked at Africa for other reasons, other challenges, I'd say. But what's been so great is that, you know, especially in in a small country like Ghana, Every place has identity politics, but they're taking that in their own hands through art and through culture. And they're really hungry to to reveal that, to talk about that through their art and through these figures. You know, I, I often ask myself, you know, why is portraiture made such a comeback? But it's made a comeback in this realm, right, of African-American or African art. And it's beautiful to see. Yeah. And that's a sadly a classic Western colonialist mistake where people start thinking to themselves, oh, well, because I'm paying attention to the scene now, this is when the scene started, when in reality, there's an entire history there that has gone back much further. And a place like Ghana and the Kakra has its own life, its own ecosystem that has predated any kind of interest from especially the Western art market, which is an opportune moment, I think, to segue into this idea of what the actual on-the-ground art infrastructure is like in Accra. Because we've got these young rising stars coming up, and they're now getting attention from these classical, established Western galleries and such. But what are they coming out of in Accra, especially from an educational and gallery standpoint? Yeah, exactly. And that's what makes this all the more amazing to see, this ecosystem that really exists in a country. There's no government funding for the arts. I think a lot of people are surprised to hear that because Ghana's first and highly successful pavilion at the 58th Venice Biennial, which literally, I think, and I think many will testify, kind of stole the Biennial in some ways. Everyone was talking about it. David Ajay created the pavilion. There was all the stars from the country were there, and it really celebrated West Africa's dynamic art scene. It celebrated Africa as a whole, but That seems to have been a one-off show. You know, I asked a lot when I was there on the ground, you know, are we going to see another pavilion? And people said there's no money at the moment, no investment in to support arts and culture initiatives. Ghana's Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture, which comes from World Bank funded initiatives. Most of that money, I've been told, is going to tourism. I mean, there's been some documents online that have, you know, mentioned that, but it doesn't seem to be going to the actual art ecosystem. And as a result, this lively art scene that's growing more and more is really the result of private sector initiatives, collectors, art patrons, galleries, and largely the artists themselves. I do need to mention um, Gallery 1957, which was inaugurated 2015-2016, and it's named after the anniversary of Ghana's independence from British rule. 
that has been Marwan Zakam, who's a Lebanese-British entrepreneur and also an art collector. And he loves art from the continent. He's lived in West Africa for many years, and he's really done incredible work to bring collectors and institutions to Ghana to discover the scene. And he's been behind a lot of incredible shows at the gallery. They now have a gallery in London. So that's one of the big players. But before him, there is the Nabuki Foundation, which is absolutely incredible. Um, They have a new gallery space and they've been showing, you know, Ghanaian artists for decades, but it's privately funded. So it's not something that's coming from the state. These are collectors or private individuals that are helping to spur the scene. That is one thing I should mention is that that's one thing that Ghana seems to lack. They have a lot of artists, a lot of creativity, but there doesn't seem to be yet enough collectors, whereas neighboring Nigeria has tons of collectors. In terms of education, you know, I mentioned the Gananta School of Art, which is so esteemed. Again, that closed, I've been told, due to funding in 2015. And Besides that, there's only a handful of university art programs in the country, including the esteemed Department of Painting and Sculpture at Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, which is known as KNUSD. What's, I think, incredible to know is the number of self-taught artists or artists teaching other artists. I hear Kwesi helping another artist or this artist training with this person or even at Omwako studio, there was a guy who was coming there to sort of just help out with some errands and he was painting on the wall and he said, I'm just fascinated with it. And another artist is sort of giving him some tips. So in this sort of absence of the art ecosystem that we've come to know in other major cities, artists are helping other artists. Collectors, patrons are obviously spurring and giving money when they can. While this is a structure of sorts, a sort of organic structure that's taken place, it does give rise to a bit of naivety among artists and also speculative whims of the art market. And then you get collectors or dealers from local or international coming in and trying to make a few extra bucks. So it's quite incredible what's happening. But I think what really strikes me the most still is the sort of community effort. Ibrahim Mahama, I have to mention, he has the Savannah College of Art. He's an artist that everyone will know. He's exhibited at the Venice Biennial. He's done work in Milan and Manchester. I mean, he's one of the art world's major stars at the moment. Right now, with most of the money that he's earning from his art, he's actually creating these centers of art to help other artists, to encourage local education. In Ghana, he opened up two new places, Red Clay and Kuluni, in addition to the Savannah College of Art. So he's another artist that's helping other artists, that's creating exhibition spaces, educational initiatives. And another really important element of this, which your story talks about a lot, is that it's not even just about artists helping artists. It's also you're seeing this wave of what I would call non-traditional actors making a mark in one way or another, or at least trying to in the Accra art scene. So I'd love to just go through a few of the different people and entities that you encounter there just to talk about like what they're doing and how they're different from what we might expect to see in a, a more traditional context. And I would love to start with this young guy named David Omari that you talked to. Yeah, so David Omari is the university student and is a fascinating story. So since I've been going to Africa and reporting on contemporary African art, David apparently started following me on social media. And as he kept reaching out, kept saying, can we chat? I want to tell you what I'm doing. And we had this chat on Zoom and he was telling me how through Instagram and through his website portal, Africa Art Ghana, he's introducing and finding a lot of very young emerging artists in Ghana and beyond in Africa. And as I got to know him more, I was fascinated to learn that he's still in university. At the age of 21 in July 2019, he set up this business. He does not come from an art background, and it's basically done from his bedroom in Accra. And he's basically selling, dealing, and advising artists from Ghana predominantly and throughout Africa, helping them get support through gallery shows abroad or even within Accra. He has a few art dealers. And again, it's all done online. And Africa Art Ghana, it defines itself as a digital art market for modern and contemporary art by indigenous African artists and those in the diaspora. But what really captivated me by David and continues to do so is how Really, without much, he's sort of been inspired by the success of Amwako, of Ibrahim, and talks about Marwan uh, Zakam at Gallery 1957. He said, I realize if they can do it, he said, other Ghanaians, we can also deal in art. We can also help our country and give back. He's trading artwork. They're not at huge price ranges yet. They're very affordable. But it obviously gives a lot of options for people who want to start buying and collecting emerging African artists. And, you know, he currently represents 10 artists. He's collaborating with the Cape Town-based Christopher Muller Gallery, 
be querying artists for upcoming presentations. He's gotten his artists already shows in various cities in Europe, and he has a presentation for one of them at the next Context Art Miami and Scope Miami Beach Art Fairs. He's obtaining a degree in business, but he really wants to do this. He loves art. He said, you know, we have other Amakos, we have other Kwesis, we have other Ghanaian stars, you know, in the make. Um, he said, and I want to help them too. I want to show the world that we have other younger artists as well. So he's, I guess the best catch-all term for him is a sort of artist agent, meaning that he doesn't actually have a physical space. He's not trying to be a traditional dealer. He's really using an online presence in a very dedicated way to try to build a market for these artists. And so like, that's one variation that you have there. Then you have somebody else who's sort of doing something similar to an extent, but with his own wrinkle, and that is Stephen Alati. And what is interesting about him is that he's actually a working artist himself too, right? Yes, he is. So I met Alote when I went to visit Amako's studio. I was actually going to visit two incredible artists who are also up and coming, Ajay Tawia and Aperle Doku Borlabi. And they've just recently had a joint show at Gallery 1957. And Stephen Alote basically represents them, but through Amako's studio. So Amako, a bit like Ibrahim in, in a different way, is helping other artists. He is the agent, basically, of these two artists, of so Ajay and Berlabi. And he's basically in charge of helping them, of supporting them through Amwako. You know, they both give support, critiques as well. And if one of their work sells, Alote gets a commission. But it's a different way of dealing than, I'd say, David or Mary. In some ways, he's also a diplomat by telling them what works and what doesn't work. But sort of the dealing, I think his commission that comes is sort of a way of payment for his sort of mentorship as well. I see it more as sort of a side job to his actual sculpture work, because Alote is a sculptor, than being something that's so focused or full-time as David. But again, he's another one of these young dealers that's helping take care of other Ghanaian artists and support them. I'm just curious, because this is such an interesting thing to be playing, this dual role. Is there any sense as to whether he just really ideally wants to be an artist full-time, and this is just something he's doing in the meantime to help out people he knows or talent that he respects? Or is he comfortable like playing this hybrid role for the foreseeable future? I personally think Alate just, he loves his work. He has a lot of private commissions to create these sculptural works. I hadn't heard of him before, but he does really, really strong work. And I think this is something that just sort of took place. From what I gather and what I experienced when I was there is these guys, they're friends. So they're all kind of helping each other out. I didn't sense that he's trying to expand in any way, because I think it might be a little conflict of interest. I mean, if you're also creating art, but then suddenly you're also dealing as well. So it seems like through Amwako, through kind of being a manager for Amwako's studio space, because Amwako travels a lot now, so he actually needs an alote. He needs someone to also support and mentor the artist when he's not there, actually. So this is something I think sort of happened. That's what I understood it to be. It just sort of took place. And it is a unique hybrid role. Again, you have this completely different setup here, like in the lack of sort of art education and art institutions, you have artists who have more experience mentoring other artists or helping each other out. So that's how I see it. Amwako is hoping to open a new space in the next year or so. I don't know the exact date. He wants to give this whole idea of supporting artists in a more structured environment in the future. Yeah. And when we're getting onto this topic of the risk of exploitation and speculation and all that, that leads us into one of the last entities down in Accra that I want to talk about, which is the Noldor Artist Residency. So who's behind it? What are they up to? And why has this residency become somewhat controversial lately? Yeah, so Noldor is in this extremely alluring old pharmaceutical factory in Labadi, a district in Accra. It's about a year old, and it's been set up by one of Ghana's most talked about and new players on the scene, a very young guy, very smart guy, 24-year-old, Joseph Awaku Darko, and he's an artist himself. He's, again, a hybrid in many different ways, an artist himself, an entrepreneur. He's a graduate of Sotheby's Institute of Art in London, and he launched the Noldor Art Residency, which prides itself on being one of Ghana's first ever art residencies, which raised a few questions because some artists have told me that there's been other artist residencies before the Noldor Residency, but the Noldor Art Residency prides itself on being one of the first you know, major art residencies in Ghana, 
I'm providing African artists with four week to year long residencies and each artist who's selected has a huge space where they can create art. They can live there if they want, you know, painting and creating their art all day long. The residency is administered by Joseph and cultural curator Rita Benison and advisory patrons have included architect David Ajay. I think Kende Wiley has also offered some support. There seems to be some questions raised over the amount of works that these artists are asked to leave behind. Joseph has been very clear in saying that they have to pledge to leave behind five to seven works after several month period. Other people have said they didn't want to go on record, but some people have said that they've been asked to leave as many as 21 works. So this raises some questions as to what should a residency do? Should it be commercially driven? You know, where is this money going? I mean, Joseph has also said on record that all of the money that's raised from these works goes back into maintaining the Noldor, basically. What Joseph is doing is really promoting them. I mean, he's he has a great social media account. He's really good at getting press. He's been in all of the right international um, magazines and newspapers. But there's obviously a little bit more to the story here. You know, where do you draw the line with an art residency? And how do you know exactly where the money's going? And if it's something that we don't really question, but again, if people are questioning the amount of work that the artists have to leave behind, then you wonder what's going to happen with the work that they created for someone else or for themselves. And who gets that work? How much do they sell the work for? And since this is still a very young market, that means that there's a lot of freedom to play with prices and where the art goes and to who and exclusivity and, and whatnot. So these were just some of the questions that have been raised over that. Yeah, and it's a really familiar tension in a lot of ways when you have a scene or a group of people who starts to become successful where you inevitably there will be episodes of people who are new to an industry, new to a situation, being taken advantage of, and then you end up seeing other people come up and say, hey, we're going to help prepare you and protect you from those other people who are trying to exploit you. Then the problem is that some of those people who are acting as protectors end up also being exploitative. And I'm not saying that the Noldor Artist Residency is doing that. It sounds like it's still very much an open issue, but I'm not surprised to hear that there are some questions being raised about where exactly the line should be in this kind of situation. Yeah, and I totally agree. And and this is the difficulty. One thing just that came to mind, and especially since I've been traveling around Africa and seeing these various different countries, this thirst to create art and to have a structure and a scene, especially if you're so young, it's easily to get confused. And the art market, as we know, it can be really cruel and challenging place. But how do you protect against exploitation? That is the big question. There's no international entity that does that for artists worldwide. So how do you ensure it in a place like Ghana or Zimbabwe or Senegal, for example? Right. And of course, there's also this whole other dynamic that bears mentioning here, which is just the idea of African talent coming onto a world stage into a largely white and Western driven market and being taken advantage of in all kinds of really horrific ways. So it's great to hear that there is a real sense of community and people trying to look out for each other within Accra. And you just sort of hope that that ends up working out for the best for everybody involved. Let's end on this. So we've now gone through this emerging ecosystem in Accra, and there's a lot of interest. There is increasingly a lot of money that is up for grabs. And there are a lot of things that people are really figuring out on the ground. In a lot of ways, it feels like the scene in Accra. It's a situation where the plane is being built as it flies. And I'm just curious to know, assuming Accra continues this rise, do you think there will be a point where the infrastructure there starts to look more familiar to people who live in places like New York or London or Hong Kong? Or do you think that there is really a legitimate chance that this could evolve in, in a totally different way that's maybe more responsive to just the way that the world has changed since the gallery system was established decades and decades ago? Uh, Yeah, it's, it's a great question because the art world is changing 
Ghana is off the map, for sure. Ghana had the year of return in 2019 to kind of welcome African Americans back after, obviously, what happened centuries ago and the brutal transatlantic slave trade. I wouldn't be surprised if it does become a new capital. I see it myself as becoming a new hub and one that people would take a trip to. You know, you have a lot of tourist attractions now. There are new museums. There's new structures that are taking place. David Ajay, for example, is creating a few new museums and different institutions for architecture and design. You know, if these young dealers keep moving forward and they build their own spaces, they do it brick and mortar and digital. I don't see why Accra couldn't become a new place that's on the art world map. But what's happening now, what I do see is that artists like Ibrahim, like Amwako, even Kendi Wiley, who's African-American, but he's starting all these residencies throughout West Africa, they're trying to build places, structures on the continent themselves. They want to keep the scene lively and grow it at home. And I think that should continue. It's not a trend. It's here to say. And what's strong and powerful is their desire to build a structure at home. They don't necessarily just need to go out and make it abroad. Well, I think it's safe to say that the art world would be a much more interesting place if we do indeed have a place like Accra coming up and maybe doing things in a different way. So Lots of stories left to be written about how things develop there. And Rebecca, I'm very happy that you will be writing some of them for us, I hope. Definitely. (laughs) Thank you for having me again. Thanks again for coming on. That's it for this week's episode of The Art Angle. Thanks again to Kate and Rebecca for their insights. If you liked what you heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, take a moment to rate and review us. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. The Art Angle is produced by Sonia Manalili, Caroline Goldstein, and me, Tim Schneider. Thanks for listening. See you next week.